Well, good evening, everybody. Once again, the ship feels a little lopsided. That's all right. All of you have decided to sit on one side, so I'm going to stand on this side. Does that sound good? Thank you all for making an effort to be here tonight. Um, this is a very exciting night for me. Uh, I don't know if I have seemed excited today. I have been since about 5.30 this morning, uh, and I was up till about midnight. I've just been so excited about what I knew God was going to do today in worship and then getting to share some of these things with you tonight. I want to share a little bit about what tonight is. Uh, I want to share a little bit about what it's not so that we're not confused. Uh, and then I want to open with prayer. Does that sound good? All right. Um, Tonight is not a church car conference or a charge conference. We don't have any business that we're, vo uh, business that we're voting on. Uh, but one of the primary roles of a pastor is to be the lead vision caster for the church. Uh, I've been here for two years, and I've been trying to grow in that. So tonight is my opportunity to do that with you, uh, the church, the congregation. Some of our leaders are here. Some members of our Joel Council are here. Um, they, they are part of all of this conversation, but it's time now to share some of these things with you. Uh, the congregation. So tonight is just an opportunity to talk and to cast vision. Um, and at the end, uh, we'll pray and then we'll leave and we'll move forward into what God has for us. Uh, so would you go to God with me now in prayer? God, we love you. We wouldn't be here if we didn't. We love your church. And we believe, God, that your church is here uh, not for ourselves but for the world and for our corner of it. We believe, God, that you have placed this kingdom outpost here for Robertsdale and the surrounding communities, Silver Hill, Somerdale, Loxley, Foley, all the way up to Stapleton, and everywhere that we serve people and reach people with your good news and with your healing and with your hope. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us this night, that you would speak to us, that you would ignite and inflame our holy imaginations, and that you would give us courage because it always takes courage to follow you. Would you give us openness? Would you give us obedience? Lord, I ask that you would continue to bless and guide our leaders, and I thank you for a church with such strong lay leadership. I ask your blessings upon them. I thank you for all that you have been doing in our midst. I thank you for what you are doing, and I thank you for what you will do, because while the past and the present and the future often all seem so different to us, they're really all the same to you because you are the God who stands outside of time and you already see what is not yet to be. You hold the future and so God that gives us great comfort and great hope. And Lord help us to believe tonight that the glory years of Robertsdale are not behind us but they are ahead and that you God will lead us there in Jesus name, amen. Amen, come on in please. We may end up shutting those doors because uh, the afternoon sun's beating in here. So, and I'm wearing this shirt. Thank you all so much for making time to be here. I want to celebrate uh, some things that we haven't been uh, sharing with you as we've gone along. And honestly, w one of those things, which will be the fourth thing that I celebrate, uh, it got done a lot quicker than I anticipated. So it kind of snuck up on me. Some of you have heard about some of these projects, but I wanted to celebrate some of the good work that our leadership has been doing. Uh, not just our, our Joel Council, but also some ministry team leaders and some lay leaders in the church. Uh, first of all is the landscaping project. This first picture is an old picture of the church. And uh, I know it's kind of small on the screen. Am I in anybody's way? Can everybody see a screen if I stand right here? Okay. So you see the shrubs and uh, what the landscaping used to look like. Now throw out this next picture. This is what it looks like now. And you'll see the flower beds on the corner. I mean, you can see this if you're outside, but I know if you're like me, sometimes you go right by it and you don't even pay attention and you can see the drastic difference. And then we've got another close up next. And then next uh, over by the fellowship hall and the courtyard area and between the sanctuary and the fellowship hall, go to that last picture. Um, there were all kind of shrubs there that were actually cleared out, and, and it's just so beautiful. So I'm grateful for the work uh, that our trustees and our Joel Council have been doing. I'm grateful for Brenda Pierce, uh, who kind of headed up this project, and I'm grateful for many of you, uh, because a lot of you uh, gave to this project when it wasn't in our budget, but you helped it become a, a, a possibility, so thank you for that. Um, next picture, I'm going to zoom in on the top of the fellowship hall, because this was really hard to see. I tried to take pictures of the top of the sanctuary and other places, and they didn't even show up on my camera, but where the red circles are, those are lightning rods. 
And about a year ago, I don't know if you're aware, but our telephone systems were getting fried, our copy machines were getting fried, our soundboard was getting fried. Uh, so the Joel Council actually did this very unglamorous project um, and, and we really worked hard to get it done. It was not, it was not a small or an easy thing, but uh, basically a, a company called Bonded Lightning Company built a grid in the, in the ground of our campus and put all these rods on the building and put cables going down the sides of our building to bond the structures to this grid to divert lightning and electricity away from the campus. So uh, that's been a huge help. I mean, this time last year, we were just so frustrated and we haven't been having those issues. Um, next is a project uh, that I'm really excited about and I wanna thank Wes because he was really the visionary behind this, uh, but the Joel Council went in too. Um, the youth uh, helped do this. The Joel Council supported them. It wasn't all one or the other, uh, but this was really Wes's vision. If you notice the flooring, go back one, one slide to the worship area. So this is standing at the front of the youth room. I, I wish I had before and after photos. Some of you know what the carpet used to look like in there. The reason I don't have any before photos is because when I tried to take them, the camera kept breaking. So I only have after photos. Um, but there used to be this giant, these giant white boxes that kind of doubled as seating and storage with multicolored cushions on top of them. And, and it was just an old and tired space. And it was, in a, it was a space that wasn't very inviting to junior and senior high students. So uh, we now have a worship space with chairs. And then this, this area in the back, when you first walk in, is actually a study area. So this is where they congregate on Wednesday nights and Sundays when they're doing small group lessons. And they have a TV where they can watch DVD curriculums. There's a cafe table and a rug. And the flooring uh, is, is a big part of it. So, um, you know, we may continue to do things with that space to help the whole thing uh, continue to match and look good all is one space but Wes I want to thank you for the outstanding job uh, of seeing how that space could look better and Joel Council thank you for supporting him in that and then finally um, talk about not glamorous I don't know if you can tell what this picture is but our church was not or the excuse me the, the oldest building on this campus uh, is the one the offices are in the jam room the preschool the bathrooms and in case you didn't hear what the, the rooms I just described, those are all very important spaces, yes? <laughs> and that, that strip of building that used to open to the outside was not built on a foundation, it was built over a crawl space because back then buildings weren't built so much on a foundation and because of the um, kind of land that that building was built on once upon a time. Anyway, the, the space between the ground and the wooden joists that you see was collecting moisture. Um, we found that there was air that was kind of moldy, not good air was actually coming up into the building itself, the offices. I don't know if you noticed, but I lost my voice about three times over the past nine months. Um, and, and we believe that this may be part of it, but what, what the light shining on is insulation that's actually falling down to the ground. Uh, insulation that's supposed to be in the bottom of the building. And there were places where um, it had not rained for weeks, but you could put your finger and water would just start coming down. It was just holding water. Go to the next picture. Um, and the, the stuff you see in the bottom right hand corner is actually insulation that is no longer attached at all. It just fell straight down. So um, the Joel Council actually met with some contractors, got several bids, uh, and we had the crawl space uh, finished out with, um, and I'm so not good at this stuff, but we basically put dehumidifiers in there. Uh, they finished it out with uh, a kind of material that blocks the moisture. Um, they created a French drain going through the playground. So at the end of May, when you saw the preschool playground was just an absolute mess, that's what they were doing. They were actually creating a French drain that goes out to the road. So massive changes, um, most of them not glamorous. The youth room's pretty glamorous, but other than that, you know, a lot of these changes um, are, are things that you might notice or might not. But uh, again, I just wanna thank our leadership. Those are some, those are some uh, forward moving projects. Um, now, I want, I want you to hear me say something. All of those are necessary and good. And I am so grateful that we have a leadership that's willing to take stuff like that on and move quicker than slower because a lot of that stuff was stuff that really needed to happen like immediately. Um, and, and most of it was not that cheap. But at the same time, those were not moving into the future kind of things. Those were maintaining things. And I, I wanna make us aware of that because as we celebrate that tonight, 
Um, I want us to shift our focus and understand that part of why the main reason we're gathered tonight is not to talk about how we can con continue to maintain, but how we can actually move into the future. Um, so I want to thank the leadership for their good work. We're also cleaning up our phone and internet systems. Um, we're not quite there yet, so some of you have called and said, hey, is your phone? Some of you have called after hours and left a message just to see if our phone system was, was back up. So we're working on it. It's almost there. But I want to share some present realities of our church. And if you have cell phones uh, that you need to silent at this time, thank you for that. Um, one reality is that uh, we have been seeing some new people, and we're very excited about that. But for the most part, we are not reaching new people. What I mean by that is there are people that are new to us, but they're not people that are new to church. So most of the new people that we're reaching are church people. And so as a church, we've said that it's a priority for us to reach new people that are not currently reached with the gospel. They don't currently have a relationship with the Lord. They don't currently have uh, the relationship that benefits someone uh, through the community that we find and the belonging that we find through church, uh, through relationships with sisters and brothers in Christ. Our attendance is good. It's solid. Uh, it feels really good this summer because we're all worshiping together. Uh, but our attendance has pretty much been holding the line. We haven't particularly been growing. So while we've continued to receive new people, uh, we also have an aging congregation. That's just a reality. Um, the community is not getting older. The community is getting younger. And one of the challenges for our church will be to say, how can we continue to exist in a community that is increasingly getting younger with a church that so far has been worried about how it's getting older? And so I want to talk about that some tonight. Um, but we are, we are holding the line. We're not particularly growing as a church. We're, we're holding steady. As we lose people, we're also gaining people. The majority of those people that we're gaining um, are church people. I think part of that is because we have a historical-looking building. I mean, we're sitting in a sanctuary right now uh, that's very fresh and, uh, and, and I think calming and bright on the inside. But on the outside, we are a red brick, white steeple church, Right? We're the church that people think of when they think of a small rural town and let's go to church. And our doors face the road, even though um, we park beside the church and then walk around just to go in the front door, right? Uh, so part of that is how our church looks. Um, I want to share some stuff about our family that you may not know, and I think it's time. Uh, when, when we were sent here, uh, we... We were sent and told about the community. We were told about the church. We were told amazing things about this church and the ministry potential here. But even after getting here, one of the things that we hear from time to time, and it's absolutely intended to be a compliment, but we hear, man, y'all have so much going for you. You're on to bigger and better things. And I got to be honest with you, that, that kind of hurts my heart just a little bit every time I hear something like that. Because it, it makes us ask the question, well, what do you think this is? Because this is our bigger and better. So I want you to hear me say, if I haven't explicitly said this yet in a public setting, uh, that my family and I are not waiting around for a bigger church where we will get paid more uh, or where our status will change or our image as a pastor and family will change in the conference. You get that? You got it? Okay. I want you to hear that very clearly. Uh, we are interested in where God has us and what he has for us to do. And that's it. We're interested in daily obedience. We're interested in being faithful. We are not interested in our own vision or ideas. We are interested in his. And I would not be doing this if I was not 100% called and surrendered to it. I would absolutely be doing something else uh, for a number of reasons, not least of which is my terrifying fear of public speaking. Um, so I want you to know we're invested here and we're roots people. And I think that's good because I perceive Robertsdale as we've been getting to know it for two years, uh, and I grew up in Daphne, so I kind of had some working general knowledge of the area, uh, but we consider this to be a roots kind of place, which fits us well because we like to get somewhere and put down roots, and so that's what we're looking for, uh, and that's what we're doing. I want you to hear me say as a pastor um, that I understand the value of the past, but I also think that we remember the past and we learn from it, we live fully in the present, which includes acknowledging changes that are actually not happening in the future, but are happening now, uh, and, and being committed to moving into the future. That's my orientation. 
And that's the orientation that I have to lead out of because that's my conviction. Uh, and I believe that if church is going to be a place that is alive and living uh, and constantly trying to incarnate and contextualize the gospel, the good news never changes, but the vehicle does. And I think a lot of times, one thing that we get wrong is we mistake the vehicle for the destination. And that's a little bit of what I was alluding to this morning in the sermon. Um, Jesus did not have a sanctuary when he did church. Do you realize that? He didn't have a pulpit. He certainly didn't have a pipe organ. Uh, J.S. Bach had not played a pianoforte yet, right? He didn't have any of those things. But somehow he got the gospel across and he communicated in ways that were absolutely relevant to the people that he was speaking to and the community in which he found himself. And we're talking about God right? God in human form. The God who knew every society that would exist in every era, and still he contextualized everything. Everything he said, everything he did in order to relate to the person in front of him. Church continues to have that mandate. And as I think about the origins of Methodism, uh, it amazes me because John Wesley was in an institutional church, the, the Anglican church, the Church of England, and he looked around and he saw this institutional church that he said was like a sleep it's like people were dead. He used really harsh language. He called them whitewashed tombs. He compared them to Pharisees. And the line that he wrote in, the, in his journal was, it had the form of religion without the power. Because John Wesley believed that if something's a movement of God, there's power. It's living, it's active, it's on the move, it's exciting, it's invigorating. You can feel the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And if it is of Jesus, it will succeed, even if it looks like it should fail even if people are anxious and afraid and don't know where the resources are gonna come from, et cetera. And uh, he criticized one of his good friends, George Whitfield, who was also a preacher because uh, George, hey y'all, come on in, hey Miss Ruthie, glad y'all are here. Hey Mr. Bruce. Uh, he, criti he criticized one of his uh, friends, George Whitfield, because George was going out and he was doing this new thing called field preaching. He was going into the fields and preaching. And John Wesley could not, con could not conceive of what he called the vileness of field preaching. But then he did it, and he saw people come to Christ, and he couldn't deny the power and the impact of doing that. And, and as I heard that story, I thought, Jesus was a field preacher, right? I mean, the Sermon on the Mount was delivered on the side of a hill, outside, in open air. Uh, and so a lot of times we confuse the vehicle for the destination. The sanctuary is not the church. You are. We are where we gather and we do life with God and one another. So I wanted to share those things uh, as convictions and orientations as I talk about some next steps. Are you ready? And these have to do with vision. So, um, you know, hold on to your belt loops. The first is that uh, one of the first observations that I had when I got here was I had never seen a church like Robertsdale that had paid staff, but zero paid music folks of any kind, worship, music, um, and, and that's amazing. Our music people give so much. And uh, I want you to know that uh, this past week, I, I met with Mr. Harold Clendenin, one of our co-choir directors. Harold, how long have you been helping to direct the choir? I came here in the early 60s. Okay, the early 60s, right? So 50-something years. Three or four preachers ago. Three or four preachers ago. <laughs> Paul McKinney has been co-directing the choir uh, with Mr. Harold. And uh, I remember the first conversation I ever had with Mr. Paul, he came into my office and he introduced himself, I'm Paul McKinney, and I just wanna let you know that we're so excited you're here. And he sat down in one of the chairs of my office and he said, now listen, I want you to know that uh, you know, the music program of this church is very special, we're very dedicated to it, but I'm not doing this forever. And you just need to know that up front. And I said, okay, I heard you loud and clear. And that was two years ago. Uh, and so, I, you know, as I think about our next steps, and I've talked to the Joel Council about this, and I think we're ready, but I think it's time that we take that step of looking for uh, some at least part-time staff to help with the music. And the reason is because our volunteers are serving a lot, but they're also leading, and they're leading in ways that they uh, shouldn't have to and aren't necessarily passionate about, like coming up during the week and making copies of music and trying to coordinate with media people to make sure what they have and scheduling rotating music folks to make sure that they're at rehearsal 
at all, uh, much less on time, and that the right people show up on Sunday, and that we're not deciding five minutes before service who's playing what and that kind of thing. And to have a part-time staff person to provide that kind of leadership and oversight, uh, to bring relief to a lot of volunteers who have worked so hard for so long so that they don't burn out and they don't just, you know, say one day, I can't do this anymore. Um, we, need to, we need to move forward before that time comes. So uh, we're looking at hiring a part-time music director uh, to oversee the service that we have to include choir, uh, praise team, the administrative and organizational tasks uh, that have been so far on the volunteers. Um, it's one thing to sing or play an instrument and to come and do what you love to do. It's another thing to have to um, look at the overall picture of worship and, and, and do all the things that I've talked about so far. We're also looking at hiring a second part-time music person, and this leads into step number two. Step number one is hiring these two part-time positions. Step number two is that this church has talked for a long time about starting a new worship service, a new worship service for new people. Um, that what we have been doing the last several years, uh, even when we go down to one service, we go back to two services, and those two services are identical. And that service is serving our church well. I mean, if you were here this morning, you see that that service is serving our church very well. Uh, there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of enthusiasm. The worship is authentic. It's passionate. It's friendly. Um, but we also are aware that there are people that we're not reaching. And we've been talking about those people, and we've been talking about not reaching them for a long, long time. We've been talking about how we want to somehow reach younger generations uh, who maybe can't relate to the kind of music that we're singing or the way we structure our worship or the location that it's held in. And so the other part-time position that I'm looking at is a young worship leader that would primarily be here 10 to 12 hours a week to help us design and execute a new worship service. This worship service would intentionally focus on reaching the unchurched and the de-churched. Uh, it would provide a kind of music that younger generations relate to so that they can worship the way that they uh, desire to and are passionate about. Um, I'm thinking of maybe a, a student or a graduate of the University of Mobile, um, partly because I'm biased and I went there and I know what kind of music and worship programs they have. Um, but that new service, uh, would have new people in mind. And one of the things that I've learned from healthy growing churches and from leaders is that new places equal new, excuse me, yeah, new places or new spaces equal new faces. And I talked about the historical look of our building and I look in the fellowship hall and I say, man, we've already kind of retrofitted a room that's ready to go for a worship service. In fact, we do use it for a worship service at Celebrate Recovery on Thursday nights. Uh, and if we needed to, we could even move out the round tables and set up just chairs to where we could accommodate a pretty large group of people. Um, and so my thought is to start that new worship service in a new space so that the environment is different, the style is different, and the worship service itself is a blank slate for whatever we need to do to reach a new group of people. Now, here's where we get our cheese moved. Uh, anybody ever heard that old book, Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah. So I was talking to somebody recently, and I loved what they said. It was so profound. They said, uh, you can't have change without change. Now, that's deep. I mean, I had, to, I had to chew on that. Because the reality is we say we want change. We say we want different results. But we don't always want to have to do anything different to get those different results, Right. Uh, but the reality is we can't have change without change. So, of course, the question becomes, where would we put this new service? Um, you know, whose cheese is going to get moved? And here's my thought, and I'll try to explain why in a way that makes sense. Um, my thought is to move the existing service back to 830, because the 830 service uh, tended to have a better attendance. Uh, it had a lot of energy. And if we're reaching younger people, especially if they have small kids, uh, families with small kids cannot make it to an early morning service. They just can't, nor do they want to. Uh, so a later service in our community, I think, would accommodate the kind of people that we're trying to reach. So uh, move the 10 o'clock service that we're currently doing to 8.30 and use that 11 o'clock hour to launch a new service. And I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, hopefully, if we can get our feet under us and actually uh, pray through this and see God provide resources, I'm looking at October. That's three months from now. Uh, I think we could plan that. I think we could put a job description out there and get someone that could help design and execute this. Uh, we will need a seed team. We'll need 
people uh, that hopefully can plan to attend that service as it's getting started so it's not just totally empty when new people show up. Uh, but the, the hope would be that between October and definitely the first of the year that we could actually see a, a new service happening that we've been talking about for a long time in order to reach new people. Um, that does get into some media upgrades, which we've been talking about for a while, but we may need to upgrade some of the stuff in there uh, for a full worship service, and we still need to upgrade some stuff in here. Our, uh, my computer is currently plugged in because the other one wouldn't handle some of the graphic stuff we have going on tonight, um, and our soundboard uh, still needs to be replaced and things like that. So we're seeing the need not only to maintain, but to do things to move forward and prepare for the future. All right, so so far I've talked about hiring two part-time staff positions, and I've, I've talked about launching a new worship service, and I think that's pretty big, don't you? You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> and here's thing number three, and this is, my, this is my, uh, my last big dream for the night, and that has to do with the land. So when I was coming here, I was told, Robert Stell has no debt. And I said, come again. And they say, yeah, they have no debt. Church has no debt uh, in a great place financially, great resources, uh, great position, location in the community, great visibility, all this stuff. Oh, yeah, and they have nine and a half acres of land. I said, what do you mean they have nine and a half? They said they have nine and a half acres of land. It's not being used for anything. It's just sitting there waiting for a purpose. And then I got here, and I started hearing the history of the land. And we've owned that land for about 15 years, and one of the big questions has been, uh, what do we do with that land? Now, my family and I have been here for two years, and we've been taking time to try to know the community and the heart of the community and the people. And one of the things I believe is that the purpose of the church is not the building we are in, but the people in that building making connections and making connections with other people and even making connections with people outside the building and the community. Church should be a place where people are full of Jesus and that spills over to the other people around us so that when we leave, we're no longer just making connections with those inside, but that worship and fellowship is fueling discipleship and mission, right? Um, so we should be taking it outside to our schools, to our workplaces, to our homes, to our neighborhoods. And as humans, um, we're created as holistic beings. And I think this is something that we neglect sometimes. We're body, mind, and soul. Uh, we are all of that together in one integrated person. This means that we think and we feel. There are not some people that just do one or the other, though we may think that at times. Uh, we want to connect with others. All of us do. We want personal connections in some way, and we're made to connect with God and his creation. So 15 years ago, the church had a vision to relocate to this piece of property. And if you'll go ahead and go to the next slide, um, this is the piece of property, the green diamond in the upper part. Those two roads uh, are the corner of Kerchak Lane. So if you go down 59 to the high school and you hang a right where that gas station is, right past Sweet Home Coffee, thank God for Sweet Home Coffee. You take a right there and you're on Kerchak Lane. You go down past the uh, Hatfields neighborhood. You moved. Now I don't know where you are, Hatfields. Hey, Hatfields. Uh, you go down past the Hatfields neighborhood and you come to the stop sign at Palmer which is also 65, right? And that upper right-hand corner is what you're looking at on the screen, that big green square. Now there's a small part that's not usable, and you can see how small it is because it's that top corner. And, and there's a little tree line and I think a water line that goes down the side of it. Um, and that, that is adjacent to the person's property right next to it. But the vast majority of that big green field, the way vast majority, uh, is very clean, usable, fresh land. Uh, go to the next slide. This is what it looks, okay, sorry. So uh, I'm gonna come back to that. I'm not ready for that yet. Go, uh, go, to the, go to the slide after that. Yeah, so this is what it looks like from the road. This is a crude uh, like Google map street view image. This is what I saw when I went there the other day. Go to the next slide. There's no filter on that picture, by the way. It was that beautiful. 
Um, incidentally, I was standing right outside David Kitchen's house. He's our finance chair, sits on the Joel Council. And I'm looking at the uh, front corner of that land. So go to the next picture. If you drive down and look at it from the side, so now I'm facing Kerchak Lane where the stop sign is, and I'm, I'm at the uh, other corner. That's a soybean field that's currently being farmed by Greg and Donnie Salick, uh, who I've also met with. And they have been leasing that land for over a decade. And they've been leasing it for, you know, next to nothing, a couple hundred dollars a year. Uh, to farm it. And honestly, that has been a huge benefit to the church because would you want to go out and, and mow that thing if they hadn't been farming it for the last, you know, 12 years just for it to sit there, right? Um, so 15 years ago, the church had a vision to actually relocate out to that land and, and leave this property because of, because of the thought that we were landlocked and that we were prevented from growth here. 15 years ago, there was vision, there was forward motion, there was hope, and there was even faith to step out on doing something like that. But what strikes me is that God saw the future. And when that happened, wherever people were at that time, whatever the general or mixed feelings of the church was at that time, it happened. And God knew it was going to happen. And God saw us sitting here tonight. And seeds were planted. And that land has been sitting there for 15 years. So God set something in motion. But honestly, about six months ago, I started really praying and thinking about what our next big thing was. Because for a year and a half, I was your pastor, and my prayer from day one, in fact, from May of 2017, before I ever got here, was, God, I don't want my ideas and vision for Robertsdale. I want yours. And so for a year and a half, I prayed for vision, and I prayed for vision, and I prayed for wisdom. And I started thinking, okay, God, I don't feel like you're giving me a burning bush, so maybe I should just trust that your Holy Spirit is at work within me. And maybe I, as a leader, need to just start thinking through some things and making some plans. And honestly, the biggest thought I had was, I think we need to sell the land. I went out to the shed, and I saw this future home of Robert Still United Methodist Church sign. And I could not believe that we still had it, sitting in a shed. Um, it was made to put on that land that Robert Stell never relocated to. And I started thinking that was a dream. And, um, and I, I hope you're okay with me saying this, but one thing I've observed about this church and this community is we walk around with a lot of grief. And I think that needs to be said out loud. And I think it needs to be named. Because uh, life in rural communities is tough. I don't need to tell you that, right? I didn't grow up in rural communities. Uh, many of you did. But you know that when tough things happen, you just got to keep going. And oftentimes what that does is it perpetuates a cycle of not stopping to grieve. And if we never grieve, we can never really heal, and we can never move into whatever's next. And that land I saw as a piece of grief, a, a piece of the past that was um, causing us to be hindered from whatever God has next for us. So I started praying about the land. I started talking to wisdom people. But then, on Saturday, April 27th, I remember the date. I don't have to read it or refer to it because it was significant for me. Uh, April 27th was a Saturday. My kids were actually up here that morning with BJ and the music folks preparing for a Sunshine musical, a Sunshiners musical, and I had been feeling for several days like God was calling me out to the land. And I don't know about you guys, um, but I'm in ministry. And so sometimes I make the mistake of saying, you know, God and ministry and faith are my job, and so I'll schedule that during the work week when it's convenient for me. <laughs> So God had been prompting me to go out to the land, and I was thinking, okay, God, maybe I'll pencil you in uh, next Tuesday at 1030 when I don't have any meetings. And in the meantime, uh, we got back home on that Saturday, and my wife Liz said to me, I have something to tell you, and I'm not sure what's going to come of it, but I've really been praying and feeling strongly like God wanted me to go and pray over the land. And I said, really? Me too. And she said, yeah, I think he wants all of us to, like our whole family. And I said, Really? She said, yeah. So at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we put sunscreen all over ourselves and our three kids uh, because we're incredibly fair-skinned. And we went out to the land. And I don't know what we were doing, but we were out there for two and a half hours. Um, and as we got out there, it, we hit the timing just perfectly because uh, the, the field had just been plowed. And I don't know if seeds were planted or not, but there was nothing sprouting up through the surface yet, and it was perfect for walking on absolutely perfect. And as we started to walk around on the land, we, we asked our kids to pray with us and dream with us. And we started having visions. 
and it felt like the land was alive. We started looking at the houses and neighborhoods that are surrounding the land, and we felt like there was life there. There was energy. The wind was even blowing, and I don't know if you've ever heard of the Shekinah glory of God, but that's what it felt like, as if God was meeting us there, the land that I thought we should sell. And so I started thinking, okay, God, if you have something here, what in the world is it? And we, we ran across the property to, to Mildred Kerchak's fence, and our kids started interacting with the cows and looking at the cows and the little pond. And, and all of a sudden, we started thinking about um, why in the world this property would be here poised for, for use by Robertsdale. Um, Noah particularly started seeing things like a giant playground, and he even saw a big staff kitchen which I thought was really funny. It was obvious he was thinking of a place with abundant food where no one goes hungry. And just like our family, we felt like the land was asking for deeper roots. In the days that followed, I could not stay away. Several days later, I went back out to the land. Several days later, I went back out to the land. I keep being drawn there like a magnet. There's something in my spirit that wants to be there. It's like it's calling to me. And it's this fresh, gigantic piece of property. I'm not good with you know, estimating sizes, but I can tell you very easily that if you eyeball this piece of property we're currently on and you went out there and put it on the land, it would easily fit three or four times side by side. It's that large, uh, the usable part, the fresh part. Um, so um, we started praying about what this means. And um, as we were on the land, God gave us a clear word or vision, and the word was farm, not church, farm. <laughs> and it just so happened that about the time I was having these visions, there was this article that Liz wanted me to read. All right, go back to the one that says, it looks like a web page. I don't remember what it says. Okay, so there's this article, and this is about Century Church in Montgomery, and it says redesigning church for the 21st century, and I'm not going to bore you with the details, but basically there's a church plant in Montgomery that uh, bought 23 acres, and this blueprint or this, this colorful draft is a plan for a whole um, series of buildings and resources that will not only serve the needs of the church, but will intersect the church with the community in ways that will bring transformation so that it's not just a traditional sanctuary or even a family life center. Did you know that family life center is now just as churchy a word as sanctuary? Um, and I know that for a long time there's been talk of building a family life center or some kind of offsite ministry center. And I'm not saying we can't do all the things that a family life center would do on the property, um, but the greatest family life center we had in this community just got sold. And so I'm starting to think, okay, what does life in Robertsdale look like? What does it look like to intersect with our community? And uh, as Liz was sharing this really exciting article about these innovative thoughts and these new expressions of church, I shared it with Wes, and he laughed and said, that's the article I tried to tell you about two weeks ago, but you weren't understanding what I was saying. <laughs> I said, yeah, that happens to me. And, and while, while I'm having these thoughts and while I'm praying through this stuff, uh, two separate people contacted me within a week. Marin, you were one of them. Burr uh, was the other one. And both of them contacted me with separate ideas because they felt like God was calling us to go further as a church with feeding the hungry. And what Burr told me was that he and Melinda and the Sanderson family both felt like God was telling them to plant food on their own property to resource our food pantry. Th these aren't ideas I'm having to come up with. This is stuff God's already doing. And as I looked out there on the land, one of the things I don't want to adulterate is the fact that it's farmland. And so here's, here's my big idea. What if instead of building a church, because we already have one, what if we farm the land? What if we started, as of January, building a community garden uh, we can decide how big it's going to be. We can decide what we're going to grow on it. Uh, it can be a place where old and young come together and the young learn from the old. It can be a place where the lines between have and have nots are torn down because both are farming and gardening in the field side by side. It can be a multi-generational, multi-ethnic place where people are growing food while we fulfill our mission of growing people. 
and growing relationships and growing connections and growing character. It can be a place where we do eventually build on, but what if the first and primary building that tied the whole property together was a barn? And eventually the new worship service that we start in the fellowship hall got moved out to the land. Do you know how many people would worship in a barn in Robertsdale, Alabama that would never step foot in a traditional looking sanctuary? Do you know how many wedding requests we would have to do in a barn that we wouldn't even necessarily have in a sanctuary? So, uh, yeah, here's an idea. Or, or this next one. This one's just beautiful. Or what about this? I found all these on Pinterest, by the way. I didn't even know how to use Pinterest before all this, but we've been going kind of nuts, so y'all please excuse me. But this made me want to worship in a barn. <laughs> This inside picture here. And what if in addition to the barn, the barn could be used as a space where we could worship? Uh, you know, as we were doing the Antioch project and had the neighborhood meetings, one of the ideas was our youth really need a place to come after school. Our youth and children uh, need to come. We don't have a, an after school youth center. What if they could come hang out on a farm? What if they could come and do homework in a barn? What if we could have uh, church folks paired up with students to do tutoring and mentoring and building relationships? Uh, what if we could do so much more there than we've been trying? We've, we've been trying to be faithful with what, with what we have. And the Bible said, if you're faithful with little, you'll be entrusted with much. I got news for you, church. We've been entrusted with much. We haven't just been entrusted with little. So we're talking about how to use what we have even more, to see even more with what God wants to do. Go to this next picture. So in addition to a barn, uh, it could be two-story, by the way. So if we built, you know, a two-story barn, maybe there are uh, breakout rooms or classrooms upstairs, uh, any number of things. We can design it how we want. I mean, this would obviously be a building project. We would have an architect. Uh, we could dream together and create something that would meet the needs of church and community. Go to this next picture. So in addition to a barn, um, one of the other thoughts my family had was, how cool would it be to build a, an outside gathering space, a place where we could have worship outside? Uh, what, if, what if Easter sunrise service 2020 was in a place like this? You know, we've got some woodworkers in the church. Y'all know that, right? Some of them are here tonight. Uh, what? <laughs> um, what if we use the skills that we have in this church to see some of this stuff come to life? What if we turn some of our farmers loose out there uh, so that they could teach uh, city slickers uh, what, what we need to be doing to help the community? Uh, what if we could build something like this? This is a picture of uh, possibly like a prayer garden. So we could have an out, go back, go back one picture for a minute, um, an outdoor gathering space that we could use for worship, but it could also be used as a place where people just meet with God. This is the place, think of, uh, where the teenager leaves school and has been burdened all day because uh, the, the teenager was told last night at supper that morning before they went to school their parents were getting divorced. This is the place they come and they meet with the Lord and they pour their heart out. And they nail that situation to the foot of the cross. This is where we come when we receive the diagnosis. And we want to be somewhere that can connect us to God's goodness and his creation and where we can be with him in a place where he shows up and we gather with the community, but now we're there to gather just with him and to be alone with him. Uh, we could eventually relocate the preschool out there and build a bigger preschool that could continue to meet the growing needs. Our preschool is one of our most dynamic ministries that connects us to people outside of this church, and they are bursting at the seams. Um, this, this year, we are taking the step of expanding the preschool to the jam room. And uh, Amanda and June and our Joel Council are working with what we need to do to accommodate that because our wait list is so long. And, and it is such an impactful school, uh, and it could easily double in size. The enrollment could double within a year if they had the space to grow. But we don't. So what if we created a space uh, out on the farm where preschoolers could come and, and actually met with the mayor uh, within the last two weeks, and he said that one of the increasing needs in the community is daycare. Well, daycare serves a group that's even younger than what our preschool is serving right now. Uh, and there are parents that have to go to work. There are single parents, and they don't have anything to do with their kids, and they're desperate uh, for daycare. The, the head coach of Robertsdale that just came this year with his wife, they just had a baby. And one of his first questions to me as we were meeting one another is, does your church provide daycare for infants? And I said, well, no, not yet, you know, but I, I, I recognize that need, and I'll try to help you connect to whatever resources are here. Um, what if this gathering place also doubled as an outdoor preschool classroom? How cool would it be for the preschool or children's church to be able to go outside and be a part of nature? And, and, and as we're worshiping in the barn, 
what would it be like to be inside with a view of outside, whether that's through open windows or sliding barn doors that are open during the worship service, so that as we're doing worship, we can see mission. So that as we're worshiping creator, we can see and give thanks for creation. And while he's growing us inside the barn through worship, we can see the food outside the barn that's growing to serve and feed our community and the hungry. What if we had a prayer garden that you could walk through and just connect with God through nature? What if uh, even as a revenue stream, there was a part of the property that we could lease uh, to an organization that actually fit the mission of our church to help connect us to needs that we're not currently serving? Uh, Charcy works for the United Methodist Children's Home over in Mobile. Uh, what if uh, an organization like that actually had an outpost right here in Robertsdale in the center of Baldwin County? Uh, maybe a foster care organization or, or a social work organization, something that was connecting us to real needs, but if they were leasing space, that would also create revenue for us to do some of these things faster or things that we wouldn't be able to afford to do otherwise, all the while creating partnerships and connections that our church needs to connect to the community. Are you getting the vision? So this is not my dream, it is now my dream, but I believe it's my dream because I believe it's God's dream. I believe this is God's dream that he gave to me and our family, and it's starting to spread through our leadership, and I think it may be why I'm here. Because for a year and a half, I asked God, why did you bring me here? I don't wanna just do what every other pastor may be doing. I, you know, sometimes if you're a Methodist, you may question the appointment system. That's no secret. I want you to know the pastors sometimes question it too. But I want you to know that this pastor and this appointment was God ordained. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe this is where God has my family. I pictured Robert Stell United Methodist Church. I had forgotten this, I had lost this. I pictured Robert Stell United Methodist Church when I was a senior in high school and my parents bought me these cowboy boots. And, and in college, I began to answer a call to ministry, and I thought, what in the world kind of church could I ever serve? God, where could I be of any use? And I was doubting myself and thinking of all the reasons I was inadequate. And I said, you know, I would love to just go to a church in the heart of a community where I could show up in jeans and cowboy boots and fit right in, where I could be one of the people and actually help make a difference, where I could see people grow in character, and as I grow as a pastor, we could grow as a church. And I actually thought of Robertsdale, because I was in Daphne. You know, I, I didn't know what it was like to live life in Robertsdale. Um, I believe we're here for a reason, and I believe this could be what God has for us. So I want to share some, some things as I try to wrap our time up. Um, I think this speaks to a lot of needs in our community. I think it speaks to um, the fact that our school is a Title I school and it's jam-packed with kids, it's jam-packed with families that are struggling and broken. It's, our community is full of poor and hungry. Our community is full of lonely people. It's full of people that are diagnosed and undiagnosed with mental illness. Some of that mental illness stems from depression or traumatic events that they have never had a place where they can come and just have space to share that stuff. We are making a difference. Celebrate Recovery on Thursday night is making a difference. Our food pantry is making a difference. Our preschool, our children's ministry, our youth ministry are all making a difference. I didn't even say how much we need dedicated space for youth and children beyond what we have here on this campus. Um, but all of that is part of this dream. And, uh, and I see the gifts in our congregation. I see this as being Robertsdale. I see it as being us. Uh, farming, woodworking, education. We have a lot of people that have spent time in education. They know what it's like to work with students. Um, giving and generosity. Do you know that giving and generosity are spiritual gifts? Do you know that some people actually have the spiritual gifts of accumulating wealth and giving that to see things come to pass that otherwise couldn't happen? That's a spiritual gift, and God has placed that among some here. Um, while I was praying through all of this, the, the church, including just this past week, has received a total, uh, and th these are things that have come directly to me, not through our financial secretaries to the general budget, but we have received a total of $12,500 in undesignated gifts. One of those was a large gift from a family outside this church. I got a handwritten letter in the mail with a check, and all of these gifts just said, to be used however the church needs. Something is happening. <laughs> God is leading people even outside this church to give to things we haven't even started doing yet. 
And as I think about those two part-time uh, staff positions, I don't know if you're like me, but the first thing I ask is, well, how are we going to pay for them? Well, if they, if they are, are paid about 12000 a year, there's one of the salaries. God just raised it for us. And the majority of it was, was given by somebody who's not even connected to our church. I firmly believe that where God gives vision, God gives provision. And I believe that this is, if this is what he wants for us, he will make a way. So, I want to share a few verses, um, and I want to ask this question as I share these verses. My question is, uh, what message does our church want to send to Robertsdale and the surrounding communities? What message do we want to send to Robertsdale and our surrounding communities? Um, I've thought for a long while about the difference between being a chaplain and being a pastor. And I've actually spent time as a chaplain intern. I've known a lot of chaplains. And, and what a chaplain does is, is they, they sit with you and they love you and they listen to you. And they even advocate to help you get medicated so that you're as comfortable as possible. And they are present with you as you die. And if I felt called to be a chaplain, I would be. And, and honestly, it might be easier and less stressful than being a pastor. <laughs> um, but I'm not called to be a chaplain. And I'm not called to be your chaplain. I'm called to be a pastor. And the word pastor biblically means shepherd. Did you know that? And what a shepherd does is a shepherd is responsible for the flock. The shepherd knows every sheep in the flock. The shepherd loves the sheep of his flock. But the shepherd is constantly on the move with the flock, trying to get them to greener pastures and fresher waters. That's my calling. I want to be your pastor. I want to be your primary vision caster. I want to lead, and I want to do that well. I don't always feel like I can, but I want to. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. Psalm 1 Verses 1 through 3 say, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers." Jeremiah 17 says something similar in verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. Somebody say amen. amen. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. And finally, um, a verse about God's promises and God's provision and his challenge to us to give as a way of matching him and seeing what he will do if we will just buy in uh, even when we typically have a mindset of anxiety or, or wondering how things are going to be. In Malachi 3.10 he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I want to live that. I don't know about you, but I want to live that. And so I'm challenging you and I'm inviting you to live this with me. So what are our next steps? Well, uh, our leadership and I have talked about this. I've shared it with them, and we felt like the time had come for me to share this with the congregation. Uh, obviously, this is not going to happen overnight. There are uh, baby steps that we take in following, uh, taking these larger steps. And some of these may feel more like stretches to some of us. Some of us may say, I know, I know how, how we can get that done. Let me put my energy and my attention behind that. Uh, we're going to need that. We're going to need your giftings. Uh, we're going to need your ideas. And I welcome your feedback. As I dream about the farm uh, and a place called the barn, I find myself scribbling on napkins. I find myself doodling. I find myself saying things out loud. Uh, I, I, I find myself coming up with mottos like growing hope or growing food and growing people or just the farm, stuff grows here. I mean, I, I just find myself coming up with all kind of stuff. And so I would invite you, uh, dream about this with me. Dream with me. 
Let God invigorate your holy imagination. You know, when we take membership vows, the first way that we agree to faithfully support the church is through prayer. And I'm not just gonna challenge you in a vague way to pray. I'm gonna challenge you right now to pray daily. Pray daily, because this is our church. This is the place God has us to live out our discipleship, to be on mission with him. This is our adventure. This is the place you have to do it. So pray daily for this. Pray for direction. Pray for the people and the resources to come in the right place at the right time, for our leadership, for the right decisions to be made in the right order. We want wisdom. We also want humility. And we absolutely want God's leadership. We want to be leading because we are first following his leadership. So would you pray? Would you give? I believe that where God gives vision, he makes provision. But I also believe that as we pray that, uh, we have to be ready to be part of the answer to that prayer. And I'm not saying all of the giving has to come from you, but I'm saying if you will, with me, test God in the way that he actually says it's okay to in that scripture we just read, to begin to give and say, God, I can't give everything. I may not even be able to give a lot, but I will give in order to invest in what you're doing. And I wanna see what you do with that. I wanna see if you'll do the miraculous ministry of multiplication to see our gifts come together to accomplish things we have not dreamed of yet and that we can barely begin to imagine and think of together. And then three, I wanna invite you to serve. This is not gonna be the kind of future that we walk into where a lot of us sit back as spectators and cheer on three or four people. <laughs> this is gonna be an all in, full church, all hands on deck kind of, kind of thing, kind of uh, adventure. And you may be thinking of all the things that you can't do. I promise you there's a place for you. There's a place for you in this church. There always will be. There is something for you to do. There is a role for you to play. There's a job for you to execute. There is a service role that God has custom fit just for you, and we need you. We need every one of you, and we need the right people playing the right roles, doing the right things so that this all can happen and come together as God wills, and we're gonna continue to pray about that. So that's my invitation to you. Um, I hope tonight has been clear. Uh, I know that it's been a lot. I've tried to, to explain it, and I've tried to give you three things that, that I hope is digestible. Uh, also that know that you may have feedback. So let me invite you. Uh, the absolute best way for you to give me feedback and for me to be fully present with it is in an email. Um, I'm not always available by phone. If you try to text me, first of all, if it's a really long text, I may not even be able to read all of it. But uh, I'm not always able to be fully present in that way. If you email me, then you can be as long, as short as you want. Uh, you can think out what questions you have or what thoughts or ideas you have or what feedback you want to give to me and our leadership. I can share that. Uh, I can read it and be fully present with it, and I can respond to you. Um, so does everyone know my email? Here it is. If you need to write it down, write it down. It's really hard. Pastor at robertsdaleumc.com. All right? Pastor at robertsdaleumc.com. I'm gonna ask if you're a part of our Joel, uh, Joel Council, if you'll raise your hand. Thank you. Um, you see Wes raising his hand. He's on our Joel Council now. We, we asked him to serve so that youth could be represented and, and frankly, we want his leadership and his ideas and his voice. Um, Phyllis Campbell is our lay leader and our Joel Council chair. And this is your third year, Phyllis, in that role. Um, Tony Smith is our lay leader elect and vice chair. Meaning that as of January, when Phyllis rolls off, we already have a succession plan in place for Tony to be the next lay leader and chair of the Joel Council. So um, I want to thank all of our leaders for what you are doing, for what you have done. This has been uh, a major year just in terms of projects, in terms of work. Um, you guys have talked about, prayed about, um, and executed a lot of things, and I am so grateful. Uh, because a strong later, lay leadership is what has made this church, and I appreciate every one of you. Um, please feel free uh, to, like I said, email me, um, share, share your feedback. Please pray and dream with us. Can I offer a prayer for us tonight, and then I'll let you go? Thank you. God, we have for many years heard that verse from Joel 2.28 that, that's echoed in Acts that in those days I will pour out my Holy Spirit on all people, and your young and old will have visions and dreams. Thank you for the visions and dreams you have given and are giving. Help us to steward them well. God, church is not for our glory, it is for yours. 
Church is not for our comfort, it is for our growth. And church is not to serve us, it is to help us serve those who need to know you. So God, would you help us do all of that? And in the process, would you help us live lives of blessing and joy and abundant life that otherwise would not be possible? I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for those who wanted to be here but couldn't. And I pray your blessings upon their homes and their families. And God, I humbly thank you most of all for the privilege of being the pastor of this church, of serving them, knowing them, getting to share in their story, getting to love their families. Uh, God, I believe that the best is yet to come. And it's only gonna be possible if you make it happen. So Lord, we're turning all of this over to you. We trust you. We're going to need to trust you. So give us the faith to walk in that trust and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, and God bless you.